Hi, welcome to my local Stochastic Sound Synthesis Studio. Let's get things rolling with a short animation featuring a soundtrack made with a dynamic stochastic synth Blowfly. It's called Blowfly because when I created this synth, the first sound I got out of it with the default settings was this. My apologies about that. So, what exactly is... Let's try that again. So, what exactly is dynamic stochastic synthesis? How does it work? Well, one of the pioneers of the technique was Ianis Zanakis, and the principle goes something like this. Say these two points are the endpoints of one cycle of a sound waveform. Let's throw a couple more points into this space and linearly interpolate between them. In other words, join them with straight lines. Now let's zoom into one of these points and place a probability distribution centered on the point along the x time axis and another centered on the point along the y amplitude axis. These probability distributions will determine the x and y coordinate positions of the points for every point in every cycle of the waveform. Now we let the computer calculate the waveform and, as expected, each cycle looks a little bit different from the one before. This results in variations to the loudness, pitch and harmonic content of the sound as it plays along. If the probability distributions allow too much movement in the location of the points, the variations between each cycle become great and the sound tends towards noise. But if the loud variations are small, the sound tends towards a kind of phasing pitch glide and no variation whatsoever produces a completely static tone. And of course, we can have many points between the endpoints than just the two we've shown here. Another important concept in DSS is that of primary and secondary walks. A primary walk is simply the movement of the point along either the x or y axis from one cycle to the next. We can set up maximum and minimum values for the movement, which we call barriers, and we can make the barriers elastic in the sense that they will reflect the point back into the allowed space by whatever amount the calculated position of the point exceeds the value of the elastic barrier. Another thing we can choose to do is have the primary walk values become the step size in a secondary walk, and it's the secondary walk which actually acts on the point, and the secondary walk would have elastic barriers of its own. Now that was a bit of a mouthful, but this should help in making the concept a bit clearer. Say a random number generator produces a number between minus 5 and 5, and we limit the movement of the primary walk to between minus 10 and 10, and the secondary walk to between minus 20 and 20. Say the primary walk is at 6 currently, and the generator throws a minus 2. 6 minus 2 puts us at 4. Now the generator throws a minus 5, so the primary walk value is 4 minus 5, or minus 1. If we're at 7, and the random number is 4, 7 plus 4 is 11, which is 1 over the barrier 10, so the value becomes 10 minus 1, or 9. If we use the primary walk values as the step size for the secondary walk, you can see how the secondary walk moves with each primary walk value. Going to the end, say the secondary walk is at 14, a step size of 7 would put us at 14 plus 7, which is 21, but that is 1 over the secondary walk barrier 20, so the point gets placed at 19. Similarly, step size 9 would put the point at 28, but that is 8 over the barrier 20, so the point gets placed at 12. The behaviour of the secondary walk is actually very different to that of the primary walk in that the secondary walk tends to hover around the barriers while the primary walk doesn't. The reason for this is that the primary random walk stays either positive or negative for stretches of time. And when, for example, the output of the primary walk is positive, the secondary walk keeps increasing and the elastic barrier keeps folding it into the secondary walk range. I'll now show the results of primary and secondary walk algorithms in action on a point along the x-axis. On the screen currently, is a primary walk. You can see what I mean by the point remaining in the positive or negative half of the range for periods of time. And note how the point isn't hitting the barriers all the time either. Now what's being displayed is the primary walk driving a secondary walk. You can see the barriers now acting as kind of attractors. The point gets quickly pulled to one or the other barrier and spends a lot of time around each barrier. 
Now I'll touch a bit on the probability functions used to generate the random step values for the primary walk. Let's say we want a random number to be generated between minus 5 and 5 as a step size. This means the result can be any one of 11 numbers. And if any value in this range is as likely to occur as any other, we say that it is a uniform distribution. Just like what you would get when you roll an unloaded dice, for example. In what I'm about to show, the value 5 is on the extreme right, minus 5 on the extreme left, and 0 in the middle. An algorithm generates a random number in this range many, many times a second, and it places a white dot on whatever the outcome is. Now this is the result of a function which produces a uniform distribution. You can see all the values in the range turning up almost equally. Yes or no, if you turn this upside down, it's like watching paint dry, but bear with me, it gets a little bit more interesting. This now is the result of a Cauchy function, where the extreme numbers in the range are less likely to occur than the numbers closer to zero. And this is a result of an Arcsun-like function, which is kind of the opposite to a Cauchy. The numbers closer to zero are less likely to occur than the extreme numbers in the range. So you can see how the different probability functions will have different effects on the walks. Zanakis used these DSS principles in an application called Gendon, with which he, or should I say, the computer, produced sound pieces in the early 90s, such as Gendy 3 and S709. Maybe it's called S709 because he produced at least 709 sequences with the app before selecting the ones he liked. DSS is very different from other forms of synthesis in that the composer sets the parameters, such as the number of points in the cycle, the probability distribution type for the step size of the primary walk, the position of the elastic barriers and so on, and the computer produces a changing soundscape within those bounds. The tendency of the technique, though, is to produce bright, buzzy tones, not unlike uh, sawtooth waves. Now, given enough points in the cycle, and a lot of luck in how the points line up from one cycle to the next, a tone close to a sine wave is possible, but highly improbable. So, for a slightly different sonic character, I decided to apply the primary and secondary walk principles to a smooth curve, and that's the basis of Blowfly. The application uses a Bezier curve to represent a cycle of the sound. Bezier curves are used for creating characters in fonts, um, body shapes in vehicle design, animation paths in 3D tools. In fact, they're just about a part of all graphics and art packages. In my synth adaptation, the two endpoints of the Bezier curve are fixed, but there are two other control points through which the curve doesn't actually pass, but when these control points are moved about, the curve distorts into different shapes. Blowfly uses primary and secondary walks to not only move the control points, like uh, what's on the screen, but also to determine the wavelength in samples of each cycle from one cycle to the next. Now here's a cycle looking more and more stretched as its calculated wavelength increases. I also allow control over how much the elastic barriers uh, deflect the point and also how they behave. Like if a point hits a barrier, it should reflect the middle of the allowed walk space or even move to the opposite barrier. Okay, enough with the theory. Here now is a head-to-head -head of sounds generated by Gendin and those produced by Blowfly. These folk have followed the trail blazed by Xenarchus by either recreating or extending his programs like Gendin. For example, by adding new features to it or making the program real time. Or they've applied the principles of dynamic stochastic synthesis in a different way, like I've done with Blowfly. A quick online search should uncover their websites, articles and applications. <laughs>